Welcome everyone, nice to see you in person and online people, nice to not see you too. Um, I'm Justin Cormack, I'm a CTO at Docker and I've been involved in Notary Project for uh, many years through its different iterations as um, the original version and then the um, now V2. Um, Notary originally was a project that started at Docker but is now a big community effort across all sorts of companies and this is Hi, <laughs> so I'm Steve Lasker. I work in Azure and uh, a couple years ago we thought you know, we, it was important to revive the signing efforts in containers because it was a pretty important effort. Um, and this was about two and a half, three, well it was pre-COVID, so it was about three years ago. Um, and we basically got together a bunch of the people across the various clouds and providers and realized like, we need to actually solve the signing problems with the, the core issues of promotion workflows and things we'll talk about today. So um, with that, we can jump in. Yeah, so we're going to talk about a little bit about the goals in Notary V2. We're going to talk about some of the workflows that people wanted us to support and want us to support. We're going to talk about the kind of supply chain artifacts that people are interested in storing in registries. We're going to deal with the kind of question of who do you trust and why for signatures. And we're going to go through some of the open issues that are still being resolved and then where, where, what the state of the project really is is um, the goals of Notary V2 have been really to build upon existing fundamentals. We're not trying to radically make things different. We're trying to build things that people understand and know how to use and use existing specs as much as possible, but put them together in ways that are really useful for the container ecosystem. Um, so we've been doing lots of work around X509 because a lot of people asked for support for that. We're, we're, we've been a very, I'd say, very customer-driven project. I mean, um, uh, you know, we, 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 as businesses, we've all been talking to our customers about what they would like in signing, and that's really driven the, the kind of way we've looked at trying to solve the problem. We're looking to really invest in and extend existing services, in particular registries. Registries are really important, and everyone has them integrated in their workflow and they understand the security properties and things like that. So it's very important that we just build on that infrastructure rather than try and replace it. So we're just trying to add things in, a, in an additive, migratable way. And we've been really working on kind of working out what best practice actually looks like. Um, you know, obviously all these things are kind of new and you have to make, make best practice up as you go to some extent <laughs> and iterate on it. But um, it's very important we feel that and it was one of the problems with kind of Notary V1 that the signatures and the other supply chain artifacts were not really stored with the, with the images. They were stored kind of in a separate sidecar service. Um, and that's been a kind of driving point the whole through, all through the V2 is like this integrate supply chain metadata into the, into the image. Um, it, it's really all about, you know, getting integrity from build all the way through to production, making it sure it's the same image and you understand what's going, what's happening. And people have a lot of workflows where they take, say, you know, Docker Hub public images, like Docker official images, move them to private registries and, um, or have different dev and staging registries and all those kind of things where people are moving images around. It's been really important to support. Again, that was one of the problems with Notary V1 was that signatures didn't move with, with the images. And these, these kind of workflows where you, you know, you, you want you want your images to be in different places for different functions for different production systems have become really important. We'll talk a bit more about that in a bit as well. So, if we think about like signing, like, what exactly does it promise? Um, you know, sometimes we hear this term, "Well, it has to be signed," and as long as content is signed, I'm fine. Like, well, is that really true? So, you know, and who is it signed by? Who who do you who do you trust? of all those things that are assigned and who don't you trust? And who do you trust and not trust for a particular environment? Right? What you might want in staging is different than production or development or different production environments. Financial services has very different requirements than say gaming. So there's very different prof uh, profiles that you have to think about. So in the concept of who do you trust, you know, if I navigate to evil.com, it's a real site, um, it's got random stuff on there, but the evil.com is not signed. There is no HTTPS certificate on it. Um, and the, the idea here is that we wanted to be able to make a comparison to how we think about the browser model. 
because there are a lot of analogies here. And, and, we want to and, the, and the browser model has been very successful. We've got, we've got you know, encryption everywhere um, you know, in a short period of time, so it's kind of interesting to look at how this compares to containers and what, this, what the differences and similarities are. So in this case, there's no cert. The browser tells you there's no cert. You can kind of, and you can navigate through and you can find more information. So you kind of make a, a very easy decision. There's no certificate. There's no identity to who this evil.com people are. So no cert, no trust, kind of logical. But let's look at some other ones. So um, my kids are now out of college, but my daughter was doing high school research uh, or school, I don't know if it was high school at the time, pre-browser uh, pop-ups. So the only thing on the internet at the time was .com. So she went off and did whitehouse.com and was kind of a little surprised about what she found. Um, next thing I heard in the house was, Dad, Dad, please make it stop, make it stop, because pop-ups kept on popping up and every time she closed one, another one popped up and it wasn't something that my kids should be seeing. Um, so turns out that that site is signed. It's got a certificate. If you drilled through, you'd be able to see it's got a, you know, a full certificate chain. Internet uh, security research group, like, sounds legitimate. Totally is. You know, go through, and there's lots of properties on the certificate chain that says, like, this is a legitimate site. If I go to whitehouse.gov, the real one, for what at least my daughter was trying to find and where I was more comfortable with her looking, it's also got a certificate. And the certificate actually is the same, same root chain. There isn't any real discernible difference between the two. They're both completely signed. So it's like, which one am I supposed to trust there? If I go to Microsoft.com, there is a cert chain there. As a company, there's some extra information that's popped up that I can do more research on if I so choose. Um, but if I look at the cert chain, there's a certificate there. It roots up, it happens to root up to a different root chain, but that doesn't really matter much because there are a lot of software companies and other companies that have a lot of business that they count on, right? What is the internet based on? Um, there's various sites out there that it's very important for them to encrypt and have good uh, uh, security models on there. So it's very difficult to discern any of these from any level of difference. So we, we have different kind of levels of trust and different kind of rules about who you trust. Um, you know, um, it's kind of not, it's not quite the same as the browser model because you're not just trying to authenticate that, you know, just get encryption. You're actually trying to um, make decisions about policies, about things like mm -hmm. what you put in production. So it's, um, you know, what you put in production on your developer laptop might be very diff different from what you put in production on a, you know, a, banking site that's serving serving your end customers. So we need to actually think about how to have rules that you let you configure different kinds of policies for these different kinds of use case. And they're similar in the same way also, right? Like what I might want to allow as sites that I can browse and do research on are probably different than the filtered sites that I allow my kid to look at. Dev production, very similar things, right? And browsers have ways to set up safe limits and you can opt-in sites that you allow or not, and your company can provide group policy on things. It's very much a policy-based configuration. We also have different kind of routes and kinds of trust, and initially we really want to make this very configurable for the, for the end user to make a choice. So you might trust Microsoft to sign Excel and Word and nothing else because there's, there's, that's the software you, you get from Microsoft and you trust the upstream. You might want everything else to come from your own organization certificates, or perhaps you use, you know, you want to have a spiffy set up with um, you know, ephemeral signatures for your build, going back to your root, and that's fine. You might want to use um, TUF, which has a trust root per application, and it's built through on the application. And you might want to use some different mixture of these for different kinds of application. And then another thing we're seeing a lot now is um, you might want trust not just based on signatures, but on more detailed metadata. You might want to trust things that you've inspected the bill of materials on it and you've just and you, uh, made certain choices about what's in the image and whether, you, whether you're prepared to run the, the, an image based on the contents 
or other kinds of attestation about how it was built, where it was built, who it was built by, and all those, and we're seeing a lot more of that. So we really want to provide a very flexible, configurable model where you can make these decisions and perhaps change them over time. Yeah. I mean, think about it, in your dev environment, you're probably doing some pretty scary stuff with compilers and file parsers and other you know, powerful tools that you need in your build environment. That same software company might produce images or, and, or project, project or company, might produce images that you do want to use in production as well. So the same signing authority in that case won't let you differentiate dev to production. There might be some other claims or metadata that you want to make sure is available as well. That claims and metadata, you want to make sure it's signed because you know this guy Justin over here might make some claim about something. That doesn't mean that you actually Trust, like, trust, trust his decision. So you want to have identity associated with all the information that you have. So this one's kind of interesting. So this is where we think about, uh, and this is how I think in some ways Notary V1, it just the environment wasn't mature enough. This was several years ago at this point. And in Notary V2, we've learned. If we look at what workflows customers are trying to do is they're trying to bring the content into an environment they trust. So in this case, we basically have these two companies. There's this small software vendor called Wabbit Networks, and they produce this net monitor image, right? Intentionally a small company you haven't necessarily heard of unless you watch Bugs Bunny. Um, and then Acme Rockets, a typical customer, just trying to run software. So in this case, they're trying to pull some public image, and they can deploy it on their node. Maybe they should you know, want to check the signature first to see if it's really from a company they trust before they deploy it. So in that case, it was a little reversed. But what we also see is the customers that are trying to do this have security expectations. And this was the interesting thing is, you know, I've been at Microsoft a while, I've been working on enterprise, enterprise customers for a long time, is the containers are just the latest tech. They have a set of security bars that they want where things are signed, things are in VNets, especially in clouds. Right? When you're on-prem, you're on VNets. When you're in the cloud, they want to simulate those environments. If I've got a VNet around my, my in production environment or even my dev environment, how do I go and get all this new information like SBOMs or claims or scan results if those are outside of that environment? Right? They're, they're blocked. That's the VNet barrier there. Yeah, we're seeing much more of a trend that people really want to control what comes into their production environments. They want to gate everything first. They don't want to pull in uncontrolled ways. They want to basically pull and gate, which is partly why we need the signatures attached and, and all the metadata attached to the artifact so that you can bring it all into the environment, vet it, vet it sort of at, at entry point, and then basically um, you know, use it safely from then on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's great to pull, like having the internet as the source of content, awesome. Do you really want to pull something from the internet into, directly into your production environment? Right? Like, who's got a refrigerator at home or in their hotel? Like, we, you know, <laughs> we, we keep things close. When you want something to eat or drink, you want to make sure it's there. You go and replenish it, but this is, there's nothing much difference between the technology and what we do in many other you know, real-world scenarios. So everybody's got a fridge in their environment where they're storing their images and all their artifacts. And for each one of those environments, they probably have, they have another registry. So they all have a registry, whether it's one shared or different. And then that content that's coming from various sources, they're not, they're not, they could pull it into each environment, but what we also see is many of these customers are setting up what they call golden images or other registries where they're keeping that content they depend on. And then all of those different teams and those different environments are promoting that within their workflow. So, and there's multiple companies, right? This is not, people aren't using just one project or one company, there's multiple out there. And we wanna be able to look to some third parties necessarily to, hey, uh, is there some clearinghouse for some of this? So this is where Docker Hub can come in really well, and they've had this you know, historic model for there's a certain set of content you can get from Docker Hub that they have put effort into to make sure, sure it can be trusted content. And then there is the open space for all kinds of other things that you can discover as well, but there's a differentiation there. So in this case, this small company, Wabbit Networks, can publish their stuff to Docker Hub. Notice there's a single signature there because it comes from them. And notice it's not just the container image, but it's the 
you know, the signatures, it's the claims, it's the scan results, it's other metadata that they want to make available. There's a subset of that content on Docker Hub that they will say is trusted content. They've done some extra effort, whether they've built it or scanned it or done some policy on it and said, look, this is, we've taken some special look at this and this content is different and therefore it gets a Docker Hub signature. There's other content that isn't certified by them or trusted. Right? It could just be out there for discoverability purposes. The whole idea here is that Acme Rockets can consume content from multiple registries. We see lots of public registries popping up all the time. How can a company configure what that policy is? So in this case, what we've set up is a, there's a trust policy that says they actually don't trust Wabbit networks because they don't know who they are, but they trust Docker Hub and they trust a couple other vendors as well. So this is a way that they can choose what content they will allow in to their environment, and then as they scan that, provide the network poli the, the policies they want for their company, they could sign it with their own signature, and so now they can say, everything in my environment must be signed with Acme Rockets, let's say. So you can basically configure policies like per environment in different ways, so you can say which keys you trust, um, and we're integrating with, you know, admission controller type things, so Oprah, Gatekeeper, and other policy managers. So you can basically configure, configure those policy which are in the demo. In, yeah, in I mean, the, again, the idea is we're leaning into what's available today. So the signatures are associated with. I mean, we basically got a had got a model here where we have kind of um, separated signatures so that you can assign, you can uh, reference reference the artifact that they um, sign. Um, we make sure that um, you can have multiple signatures on objects in case you want that kind of workflow. Um, signatures move around with the artifact. You can, um, we sign, um, basically, um, we don't require you to pull the entire object to check the signature. We, do, we could just check the hash or the um, manifest hash. Um, and you can have a whole different sets of artifacts attached to so S bombs and yeah. or scan results and any claims, annotations, anything else you want. I mean, the model we did with signatures to be able to support attached workflows is we want to be able to put things in a registry that a registry doesn't even know what's a signature, it doesn't care. So we can associate anything because if you look at your deployment scripts, they probably say like net monitor colon v1 or net monitor even with a digest. How do you find out the SBOM for that thing? How do you find out the scan or the signature? You actually, your deployment files have a named reference. So we wanted to build on that capability. So why don't we just jump into some demos now? And let's see here. All right, so every good demo starts with a Docker build. So we'll just come over here and I'm just building an image from, in this case, a Git repo, right? So nothing special, just kind of the standard baseline there. And then we'll do a standard Docker push, right? Nothing magic. The point here is that I'm building and pushing to a private registry. Doesn't matter what cloud, where, wherever you're running your workload, use the registries that are closest because your fridge is nearby, your registry should be nearby for you know, we want to minimize the, the things that can fail between your source and destination, and you want to maximize the performance. So I want to start with just a very simple sign and verify. Now, I'll use a test cert here that we can generate. It's a self-signed cert. Just, we're just starting here. We'll show where we can have a remote signed cert here in a minute. But I just got an X509 cert, wherever you might have gotten it from. Now I can sign because I've, if I look closely, notice I've said default. So when I generate it, I've actually set it up so that I can sign with that key by default. I happen to, so I've mentioned the key, and I'm just saying notation sign, the image, or any artifact that I'm referencing. This happens to be a container image, the NetMonitor v1 image. And it comes back, it's like, okay, it's signed. It's literally that simple. It's based on a notation client and a registry. I can see what has been, actually, let me clear this, get this at the top of the monitor. 
if I look at what's associated with the net monitor image, because that's what's in my deployment chart. That's the only information I know. So let me ask the registry, is there anything else related to that? So we have this ORAS client, OCI registry of storage, and it can discover what is associated with that reference. And I could use a tag or a digest, and it comes back and says, hey, that image has a notary v2 signature hanging off of it. Now, if I want to verify that container image, I just say notation verify and pass it the path. And of course it fails because we haven't, we've got to fail by default policy because this is a self-signed cert. We don't know anything about it. We haven't set it up in our environment. So we actually need to configure that we, that, that we actually need to configure that, that we actually want to um, use the certificate. So we say cert add, we'll have a trust or, this is what the interaction is now. We will have more of trust or policies uh, coming this month. And I can now, now I've configured it that that's what I want. Now, if I say notation verify, of course it'll pass because I've said that's what I want to be allowed in my, in this particular environment. So the idea is your private keys should be kept private, right? This is kind of the model. So, yeah, most people don't really want to keep their private keys on their laptops and things like that. So. Um, one of those really strong asks we had was that for most, almost everyone really wants to keep signing keys in hardware, which means in some sense remote. It might be a, as, as remote as a YubiKey or the um, TPM on your machine, or it might be actually in, in a um, cloud provider uh, key storage or some, somewhere else that's not basically on the file system accessible to the client. Right. So we really, it's really important that we support that use case because um, pretty much everyone wants keys and hardware for, all, for everything nowadays. And this is where we just wanted to lean into the infrastructure that our customers already have. We've already got a lot of infrastructure here. We want to leverage it. That's their security bar. So the, the model is you keep your private keys private. You might have access to sign them. And those key providers, have, the key vault providers, have lots of logging to know who signed them. But you, can't, you don't have the rights to take the private key out and put it on the internet. Right? You can do signing, and it's locked down to nodes in a machine or you know, certain environments. And, and these can be ephemeral keys and things yep. that are generated through Spiffy or something like that as well. So they, don't, they, um, you know, they, they might just be a key that's generated just for that signature. Yep. Exactly. So and then the next part is, well, there's lots of key vault providers out there. So there's lots of signing services out there. We don't want Notation to have to track every one of those. We don't want anybody that wants to write a key vault provider, sorry, a, a, a a plugin to have to come to the notary maintainers and like, can I please check this into your source code? There should be a specification that says, here's how you write one. So that's what we've set up and we've basically, it doesn't even matter what language you write it in because it just does binary calls and does standard in, standard out to get the information to it. So really nice, it doesn't, doesn't require you to even use, in this case, we use Go for the notation client. And if, as you want to rev those, you completely build it all on your own. You completely keep it all on your own. You can service it, and there's nobody, nobody has to know about it outside of whoever's doing it. So let's take a look at how we can do that here. So what we've got is um, we've happened to wrote, write one for Azure Key Vault. AWS is writing theirs. We, we want to get one for Hashi Key Vault as a, an example. We haven't had a chance to do that yet. So if somebody wants to write one, that would be great. I've already configured uh, that with a uh, Azure Key Vault provider. Again, anybody can write one. And I'm just gonna, I need to get the key ID. Now, this is the path that when it's doing a remote signing, what, what should it use? Now, in this case, I happen to be using Azure Key Vault. You can use whatever you want. And then it comes back and it gives you the key ID. So if I say key ID, spell it right. It's just a path. And most key vault providers have, you know, some kind of way to reference it. And then I'm just going to say, let's go add that name to the notary, con notary config. I've said, this is the, the name of it, the key. And by the way, I'm using a particular plugin name. So it'll know to route when I say sign of that name, route it to that plugin for it to do all the heavy lifting. If I look at the key list, we 
point out that we've been gotten used to very wide monitors at home, <laughs> so we probably need to rethink about how we format that output. But then I can just simply say, no different than I did with the self-sign key, I'm now doing a sign with a key that we've got locked up in a key vault. I don't have any access to other than to do sign. I just reference it by name, and when I configured it, it knew it says that name uses that plugin, so go route it over there, and now I've got my signature uh, set up. And if I look at the list of keys associated with that image, right, that's the only th reference I have is that monitor v1, it will go and say, well, I actually have two signatures now. Now, and then it's just a matter of, well, which one do I want to allow? It's up to you for what policy you would configure. So we can see there's our net monitor, and then there will be a hash of the different type artifact types. In this case, it's signatures. We'll show when we have SBOMs and so forth in a minute. Okay, so that's the remote signing. So if you notice the simplicity of signing with a local cert and signing with a remote cert, it's still just notation uh, sign, notation verify, but you're configuring where you want those to come from. Now, that's great. I can do that on my laptop, but I don't think we're running too many workloads probably from our laptop. Maybe some ML scenarios. I mean, that, that's not completely true, but there's definitely some. It's how do I get this into some kind of production or you know, other environments? And this is where we wanted to integrate with the existing systems. So we've got a Kubernetes uh, cluster here, and I've got two namespaces. I've made it very... Um, Try to secure, you want to... Yeah, <laughs> there's a, a secured fall. and a not secured namespace. Um, we're going to leverage you know, the, the policy managers, in this case, Gatekeeper, and we've got a project we call Ratify, which is, knows how to read those references and do validations. You can do validations on signatures, can do validations on SBOMs. It's a completely pluggable model. So let's go and jump in there. All right, so we're going to create the two namespaces. So that's that simple. And then we're going to take that public image. We're going to run an Nginx image from Docker Hub, right? So, and we're running it in the not secure namespace. So surprise, surprise, it works. And then we can see you know, our pod running. But now I want to lock down that secured namespace, right? We want to be able to say that only things running in that uh, sh should be allowed to be run in that namespace that are actually signed by a key that I'm configuring. And I happen to have that public key stored in a key vault in this case. So I'm going to go grab that key because these are you know, ephemeral nodes. I don't have them deployed everywhere. If it's public software like at Microsoft, we're, we're signing our content then that public key will be available and you can curl that into we, your environment. We need to clean up some of the uh, yeah, key um, format conversion stuff. There's right? so, so a little too many today. pipings going on here, yeah. but suffice to say, I just needed to get a public key into an environment variable. So then I'm just going to take, I'm going to do a Helm chart for Ratify, and I'm going to give it the public key that I want it to secure. So I'm just doing a Helm install. Uh, and then I'm saying, you know, there's our regist well, the registry cred set up, but basically here is the public key that I want you to use. Then I'm going to create a constraint. The constraint says I want to take the namespace secured and apply this ratify constraint to it. So that's starting to glue the connection there. So I've just got this config file, and then I'll apply that to the cluster. Just apply this constraint, which locks down that namespace. So now if I try to run that Nginx image in that secured namespace, forbidden, <laughs> right? The failure that you want, right? This is the, the good failures here. Okay, so great, we've locked that down. Can I run anything in there? Well, remember, we signed our net monitor image with two keys. We signed it with a self-signed private key, which it goes, like, whatever, because I've configured that cluster to use the Acme Rockets or the Wabbit Networks key in this case. So there's a key that I've set up only allow stuff that's signed with that key. 
And so it was scheduled and life was good. Now, we talked about the promotion workflow. What if I do want to run the Nginx image in that environment? Should I just allow anything that's unsigned if it, if it equals Nginx? Well, what, what, how does that, you know, is that really what I want? Do I want to constantly pull updates from Docker Hub and, and deploy it? Well, there's a hundred different connections that could be down, having nothing to do with Docker Hub between that point. There could be a security update to Nginx that might actually not work for my environment. Remember, SolarWinds was an update that got applied. It wasn't you know, software that was bad to begin with. So a poll will simulate that import workflow. So I'm going to pull the Nginx image, and we'll then scan it. So we're basically just looking at it to see if we're, we're, we think this is OK to run in our yeah. production environment based on our, our criteria around scanning. And it'll take a look, and it's going to run against the dependencies. And remember, this is a point in time. Vulnerabilities dis are discovered on things that were already shipped. So I only know what I know today. So there's a set of issues, and, but effectively, it is the best thing that we have today. It's like, OK, I'm making that decision to be able to promote it. Now, I'm actually going to do something a little interesting here, is I'm actually going to take the output of that scan, and I'm actually going to save it to uh, Nginx, oh, Nginx scan. OK, I forgot the .json file, so I'll have to I'll remember to have to fix that. So it'll save it as Nginx scan, not .json. It should have been, but I forgot to do that. So now I'm going to tag that image so that it, it is going to be set up to, for the registry that I want to deploy from. I don't want to deploy from Docker Hub. I want to import from Docker Hub into my environment. I've scanned it. It's good. And I'm going to push to my private registry. Right? We're doing that promotion workflow. And then I'm also, and I'll remember to fix this. I'm also going, so it's doing its push. It's all good. So now I've got the container image in my private registry, almost. I think I can. I think I can. We've been good, lucky with the Wi-Fi so far. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Are we going to show how uh, duplicated images are? Finish, finish, finish. All right, we're going to show deduping. So it'll finish it up again, but it'll show that those layers already exist now. So give it a second. We're not being lucky with the Wi-Fi. There we go. See? All right, so they just have to do the item potency thing and finish up the last piece. Come on. There we go. Okay. So the image is there, but remember, I also want to associate that Nginx scan file that I forgot to put .json on. That's what I was just fixing there. I'm going to push that up also. So this I'm using the RS client, and basically I want to push to the Nginx repo. I'm going to name it SNCC scan v1, and the subject is that net. Uh, sorry, the Nginx 121.6 image. So when I push that up, I'm now saying, hey, please store that scan result with the image as well. And then we're going to sign. Come on, internet. There we go. So now I'm going to sign that image. So now I've actually got two things that I've associated with it. Right? We've got the scan result and the signature. So now if I do an ORAS discover, again, take the Nginx image, the tag, and that's the only named reference I know. What else is hanging off of that? And you see that now I've got the SNCC scan and the signature both. Right? So that's kind of nice. I can now have my objects together. The only, the only instances that I have here is a registry and the notation in ORAS clients. Uh, OK, so now I can get back to I do want to run that Nginx image, so now I can say, run Nginx. I'm naming it Nginx, but notice I'm pulling it from my private registry that has been signed with the key that I trust, because I've done the verification on that workflow, and it's often scheduled. 
right? That's kind of the beauty of it. Um, well, that's, that's basically it. So, cool, let's kind of think about that for a second. So we have several different tools that we were using. In this case, we were signing and we were generating scan results. We want all of that information to be promoted. Remember that animation we did where we said we want to take the public stuff, put it into our private registries because that starts to get inside our environment. We've secured it and we can promote it. Well, I want to show one more quick one here where if I want to copy that content from one registry to another, this Aura's client doesn't know anything about scanned results, doesn't know anything about signatures. It just says copy things from this named reference in Wabbit Networks to Acme Rockets. And because it can read those references, it doesn't need to know what they are. They just know that here's a bunch of things that are associated and I'm gonna copy them across. And then we'll get this one here. So we'll just finish that up. Again, fun with this. We need, to, we need to go on because okay. we're running out of time. I'll come back and show that in a second. So, so yeah, so we've got policy and management per environment. You can configure how which keys you trust per environment, and it's just integrated with normal uh, tools such as Gatekeeper or other uh, many just other the tools, tools are using today. Whichever right. tools you're using today to do that. Um, so where we are really, we're we're finishing up um, release candidate one uh, this month. Um, Microsoft is shipping a load of um, example sign things that you can um, test right now. Um, we'll be starting to ship Docker official images signed with us shortly as well, so there'll be more to test. But if you want some test images now, um, and RC1 will be compatible with the yep. future format, so it should be, um, should be good to test going on. There's more, more links there to give you some some and the idea is, like, we have to, like, we're a software company as Microsoft. We need to ship our software with signatures and SBOMs, the executive order in the U.S. and all kinds of other things. We want to make sure we can start testing this workflow. So, we'll, that's kind of some stuff that's available there. Um, yeah, go ahead. And we're, yeah, we're, we're finalizing the specs at the moment, just trying to put things together. Um, and, you know, we've got an alpha release working towards the RC. Um, and, you know, we've shown the things that some of the key vault providers and some of these other example stuffs, uh, there's more going on with AWS is doing work on their key signing provider. We, as I said, we're, we're working on getting official images signed and things so you can kind of test this all out and um, provide, you know, provide actual workable, useful workflows yeah. to start with. Um, so it's just, it's okay. So the copy was done. Let me just kind of do one more. So we were able to just let that, let that sink in there for a second. We wanted to be able to copy that graph from one registry to another. And so notice I'm now said, hey, Aura's discover what's on the Acme Rockets registry for what I copied. So it will give us that list. It didn't finish. Very slightly. <laughs> it's, it's traveling across the, across the pond. There we go. Okay, so, and now you can see that I actually didn't clear out my previous demo because there's actually two of, of them. So I ran the demo once before too. So you can kind of see, and that's even more important, like that was emptied before, and now it's copying everything over that I want. And of course there's filtering commands and so forth. So you can co copy the subset if you want. We've still got a, a bunch of things that are going on. We're looking at um, additional work on identities. Um, not everyone has an X509 infrastructure. Lots of larger companies do, and lots of software publishing organizations do, but individual developers generally don't. So we're looking at support for SSH keys and policy around which identities do you trust for what. There's kind of a lot of, you know, kind of a lot of options there. Still, still lots of work to do on that. Um, we're looking at things like um, inline signatures for when we're originating content with signatures straight off. Um, but yeah, this is all designed to be an extensible framework that supports lots of different use cases. So come along and tell us what your use cases are, what you need. And just the idea there is the same way that we want policies on the signing keys, we want policies on different identity types. So that's what you're kind of seeing there. Um, and here's so all, all the, the links. The wall so. of links. Yep. Yes. So I, I think we... I think we're kind of at time. time so thank you. Appreciate it. Um, do, I don't know. We have. Time I think we've run out of time, so we haven't got questions now. But we will be around. We'll be around in the hall. You find us on Slack on our 
info that's here, and we're happy, we'd love to hear more of your info. So thank you.